the breakup. That's, that, that's okay. I think Michael was just half sentence, but mid sentence, but I think it's okay. Yeah, sorry. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our afternoon uh, session uh, where I have the pleasure to um, welcome uh, Melissa Dell from Harvard University. I will say a few welcoming words about her work and then uh, she will get the floor for her presentation. Uh, Melissa is professor of economics at Harvard University. She obtained her BA degrees at Harvard and her MPhil at Oxford and took her PhD from MIT. In 2018, she was named by The Economist as one of the decade's top young economists. And in 2020, so very recently, she received the John Bates Clark Medal from the American Economic Association. Her work is focused on the long run consequences of colonialization, notably in current Peru and Bolivia, with a paper in Econometrica that is heavily cited. She recently extended that work on colonialization um, with work on the study of Dutch, the, Dutch the Dutch cultivation system in, in Java, published in the Review of Economic Studies. That long-term perspective is also apparent in her study of temperature shocks and climate, published in the American Economic Journal and the Journal of Economic Literature. Part of her work is also focused on state building which is her current paper uh, or current presentation uh, today, and which builds on earlier work on Vietnam, also uh, published in Econometrica. And last but not least, um, especially um, important for our conflict network is that she also recently published work on conflict in, in Mexico in the American Economic Review. So um, to conclude, I'm very happy to have Melissa uh, on board for our workshop uh, this year. Um, and it's digital, uh, meaning that she's presenting from her home, I guess, and in, um, in the US, in Cambridge. And I'm very happy that uh, I can give her the floor for 30 to 40 minute presentation, after which there will be time for questions. Melissa. Great, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I apologize that you'll probably hear my kids in the background, it's a holiday here in the US. so. Um, they are running around, but um, so is life when everything's remote. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about the uh, girls of uh, top-down state building today. Um, and um, so in particular, um, some of this work was motivated um, by um, these uh, prominent ideas by James Scott um, that argue that citizens have many different ways to undermine a state that they don't support, even short of joining an armed rebellion. Um, they have you know, many um, methods um, that, that they, they can use to undermine states in one way or another if they don't wish to support them. And moreover, um, Scott has argued in other work that when states try to impose a simplified order or what he calls legibility from above, um, they usually don't understand the complex local realities, and this can lead um, the schemes that they try to implement to fail. And so both of these ideas suggest the potential perils of trying to build a state um, from the top down through military force. Um, and a more bottom up approach may address some of these concerns. In practice, bottom up approaches often emphasize things like providing security while also promoting civic engagement and building trust and patronage networks um, between uh, governments and citizens. And so in this talk, I wanna think a little bit more about these themes through presenting um, a series of examples um, from um, work that I've done. Um, and so first of all, I'm going to talk and spend much of the time talking about the impacts of bombing during the Vietnam War. And this is uh, based on work uh, with Pablo Caravin, um, who's in the politics department at NYU. I'm also going to talk about hearts and minds initiatives in Vietnam. And then I'm gonna to switch to a very different context, but one that also has a lot of interesting parallels, um, which is the drug wars in Mexico um, in recent years. And so I'm going to talk about the impacts of state efforts to crack down on the drug trade in Mexico. And I'm going to talk about how manufacturing job loss in recent years has impacted drug violence in Mexico. And this is based on work with um, Ben Feigenberg um, and Kinsuke Toshima. Okay, um, so I'm going to get started by talking about efforts to build a state 
through uh, bombing in Vietnam. And so um, during the Vietnam War in the 1960s and early 70s, uh, the US employed a variety of different strategies which aimed not only to defeat insurgency, but also to create a state that would be capable of monopolizing violence in South Vietnam and preventing the spread of communism once the US withdrew. Um, and so central to their um, objective, it wasn't just to defeat particular people, but to build a state that could um, stand as a bulwark against the spread of communism when the US withdrew from the region. And so in particular, you could group their strategies into to two general approaches. Um, the first, which we've termed overwhelming firepower, emphasizes emphasizes establishing control by making it very costly to oppose the state. On the other hand, the US also pursued hearts and minds initiatives, which emphasize providing public goods, creating economic opportunities, and promoting civic engagement. Um, and so um, to say a word more about overwhelming firepower, it emphasizes establishing control through force. And in the case of Vietnam, through overwhelming force. And this approach was central not just to counterinsurgency, but to getting people to obey the state in general in their everyday lives. Even you know, short of they might not join an armed rebellion, um, but the idea was to incentivize um, cooperation with the state more generally. And you very much um, see this um, in uh, the writings, um, et cetera, from admin administration officials. And so in particular, one of the most prominent advocates of bombing during the Vietnam War was Walt Rostow. He was an MIT economist, and he was also Lyndon Johnson's national security advisor. Um, and he argued that in order to counter communism, this required a ruthless projection to the peasantry that the central government intends to be the wave of the future. So Rostow saw communism as this disease that plagued societies that were newly industrializing and developing and to keep them um, from uh, you know, coming down with that disease, you had to show them that the central state was going to be the wave of the future, that it was going to be in charge. Um, you see similar ideas in the work of Sam Huntington, who was a professor of government and an influential, influential policy um, expert under Nixon. And he argues that airstrikes could be used to establish social control. And then once you have social control, that's the precondition for modernization and that will follow organically. And so for these social scientists, they go you know, beyond the traditional military leaders. It wasn't just about establishing a military victory. It was about getting people to um, consent to living under the rule of a strong centralized state. And you do that by force. Um, and um, I think more than almost any other conflict in human history, we see this approach pursued in the Vietnam War. Um, the US dropped more than twice as many tons of explosives um, uh, during the Vietnam War um, on North Vietnam as compared to South Vietnam. Um, they dropped far more explosives than had been dropped during all of World War II. Um, about 500 pounds of ordnance for every man, woman, and child in Vietnam were dropped during the conflict. Um, between 1965 and 1972, the US um, Air Force flew 3.4 million combat missions over Southeast Asia. We reported this statistic in our paper and the copy reader for the QJE told us, you made a typo, uh, this must be a mistake. Surely there weren't that many bombing missions, but there in fact there were. Um, around 400,000 tons of napalm were dropped. Um, there were 285 million like small bombs that were dropped over Vietnam. And uh, the US expended um, far more ammunition for soldier um, than it did in World War II. Um, and so in terms of the rules of engagement, directly targeting civilians, of course, violated the laws of war. Um, but in practice, uh, the rules of engagement allowed for many scenarios where civilians could be hit. Um, so if any type of fire came from the vicinity of the village, um, the US could attack without warning. Um, if civilians were thought to be supporting the VC in any way, i.e. by providing food, the village could be targeted. Um, the US designated some regions as free fire zones. And so um, the people that had lived there were told that they had to leave. They had to get, leave their homes and get out. And if they didn't, they were assumed to be the enemy. Um, so in practice, the onus was really on Vietnamese civilians to prove that they weren't insurgents. Um, and um, so in practice, this meant that they were often hit 
by higher power. And so you see that in this leaflet that was dropped over Vietnamese villages, it says the US forces have joined with the forces of South Vietnam to rid your village of Viet Cong agents and protect your lives. The Viet Cong hide among the innocent women and children in your villages to fire upon troops and aircrafts. If the Viet Cong in this area use you or your village for this purpose, you can expect death from the sky. Do not let the Viet Cong be the reason for the death of your loved ones. And so they're essentially they're saying, you know, even though you're you guys are unarmed civilians and the Viet Cong are armed insurgents, you have to figure out how to stop them from using your village um, for their activities. And if you don't, um, you can expect to be bombed. Um, and you know, in fact, um, this happened a lot. And so you see here the napalm girl image of. Vietnamese children being burned by napalm, uh, which became kind of a rallying cry in the anti-war movement in the US. And of course, this time it was caught, you know, and photographed on, um, but this sort of thing was, you know, happened um, frequently. Okay. And so to kind of sum up the views that are out there on overwhelming firepower, which we will test, um, you know, the first view is that the solution in Vietnam is more bombs, more shells, more napalm. Um, and the idea is that you just unleash enough firepower. They understand that you mean business, that the central government is going to be in charge, and so they don't try to contest that. It's a very kind of top-down authority type of view. Um, whereas the opposing view, which was uh, voiced by a, a North Vietnamese military leader is never before that the people of Vietnam from top to bottom unite as they did during the years uh, that the US was bombing us. Never before had Chairman Ho Chi means a pill. That there is nothing more precious than freedom and independence gone straight to the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people. Um, and so essentially these views kind of turn on whether you think aggression is a strategic substitute or a strategic complement. You know, the traditional view and kind of US leadership is that it's a strategic substitute. You're really aggressive and the enemy backs down. Um, but you know, um, what we will show evidence of is that it's more a strategic complement. You're really aggressive, that angers the other side and they fight back and it undermines um, the US's military objective. Um, and so obviously testing the impacts of overwhelming firepower is not a trivial thing because of course the US may decide to bomb places where security um, was already um, deteriorating in any case. And so we really need an identification strategy um, and um, we are able um, to find one um, in sort of the approach um, that Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara um, pursued in the war. And so during the Vietnam era, for the first time you had computers that made it possible to analyze data on a large scale. And Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense for Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, um, pioneered the idea that you integrate systems analysis into public policy. You use this massive amount of data along with theory um, to plan your wartime operations. And so um, in particular, McNamara launched a variety of systems to monitor the progress of the war. Um, there was extensive data collected at the hamlet level. Those are like neighborhoods. There's 18,000 of them in South Vietnam. And those data were key punched into two mainframe computers in Saigon and in Washington that were the most powerful computers in the world at the time. Um, and, you know, fortunately, um, by kind of an accident of history, um, these data were preserved um, and we were able to um, access them at the National Archives. And so this is a picture of the IBM System 360 uh, supercomputer. Um, you know, of course, this is less powerful than, um, you know, your watch or any kind of uh, com computer that you, that, that you would use today, um, but it was kind of the best of the time. And so, um, this computer was used to process data that were collected at the Hamlet level that combined 169 different questions asked on a monthly or quarterly basis about the security, politics, and economics into a security grade for that Hamlet, which was either an A, which is very secure, B, C, D, or E, which is very insecure. Um, these data were collected by US advisors in conjunction with local leaders, and we show that these were used to allocate airstrikes. Um, essentially, the U.S. is dropping so many bombs on Vietnam um, that um, they cannot use kind of the traditional intelligence methods to decide where to drop them, and so they use this score. If you're an A, you're less likely to get bombed than if you're a B, which is less secure. You know, if you're a C, you're less likely to get bombed than if you're a D. 
And so we're going to exploit the fact that this score was constructed from those 169 questions using a Bayesian algorithm that computed a continuous score that ranged from one to five. Um, but the declassified memos revealed that it was just deemed too difficult and time consuming to print off these continuous security scores from the memory of the computer. And so nobody ever saw the continuous scores. They were rounded. Um, and only then were they printed off the computer and disseminated um, to military planners. Um, and um, so a long search led us to a basement of an army base um, in the US um, in which we were able to find the information that we needed to reconstruct this algorithm and to compute those continuous scores. And when we round them, we're able to reproduce, you know, 100% of the A, B, C, D, E, or uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 um, security scores that were disseminated to military planners and used to, um, uh, to allocate bombing. Um, and so essentially what we're going to do to identify the causal effects of bombing is to compare places that were a 3.49999 and got rounded down to places that were 3.5001 and got rounded up you know, to an A rather than rounded down to a B. We compare those places right there on the threshold. They look identical in every respect beforehand, um, but one place happens to get rounded up and be classified as more secure, and the other place happens to be rounded down and get classified as less secure. Um, and we're gonna instrument um, bombing with which side of the threshold the Hamlet is on. And um, we're gonna look both at um, bombing in the quarter following the dissemination of the score, and we're also going to look at average bombing for the remainder of the war. And the reason that this works is that bombing will show initiates this dynamic feedback loop. And so if you're just barely below the threshold, you're more likely to get bombed. We're going to show you that being bombed um, leads to a deterioration in security, um, which means you're more likely to be bombed the next quarter, and so on and so forth. And so if you're just barely below the threshold when they start collecting the score, that makes you more likely to be bombed uh, for the remainder of the war. And we see this here. Um, and so this is essentially the raw data. All we've done is take threshold fixed effects. So we combine you know, the different thresholds, the one um, being you know, rounded down or up to an E and a D, a D and a C, so forth. Um, but you essentially, you know, in this, you know, in, in this raw data, you see the effect. And so if you're just barely below the threshold, you get rounded down, you are more likely to be bombed. And you can see in the bin data that discontinuous drop if you happen to get you know, just barely rounded up. So you're um, classified as more secure. Um, so being below the threshold increases the share of months hit uh, by air artillery fire in the following quarter by 5.4 percentage points relative to a sample mean of 28% of places that are getting bombed. Um, and so this is a pretty substantial effect. Um, and you see the same things when you look being just barely below the threshold that the impacts on being bombed uh, for the remainder of the war. Um, and you can look, you know, at contemporaneous bombing. It takes time for the score to be disseminated and used, bombing in the pre-period, etc. And you could look at all kinds of, you know, pre-period characteristics too. And essentially, everything's balanced. And so this is showing that this is this is plausible. These places look the same beforehand, and then they just get unlucky and get rounded down, and they get bombed um, with much higher probability. Um, and also the score doesn't affect other military applications. We show that in detail in the paper. So that allows us to use it as an instrument uh, for bombing. Um, and so first of all, we look at how does this affect military activity of the Viet Cong insurgents. And so if you um, um, move from no bombing to sample mean bombing, you know, as instrumented by being below the threshold, um, you see um, significant increases in armed Viet Cong presence in the hamlet, on whether or not there's a local um, guerrilla squad that's present, on whether or not the Viet Cong sends its main squads, which are its troops that, you know, move around different villages, um, whether or not the Viet Cong sets up a base nearby, uh, whether or not um, the Viet Cong attacks in the hamlet. And so this is just whether there's an armed Viet Cong presence in the hamlet, it would be balanced beforehand, then you just barely get rounded down, so you're more likely to get bombed, and you see this discontinuous shift upwards in Viet Cong presence, meaning you get bombed. What happens? Um, more people in your um, hamlet join the Viet Cong. Um, and we see that in political activity as well. And so this is an example of 
uh, what's called the Viet Cong infrastructure, which is the political branch of the Viet Cong. It's more likely to be active in the village. So you get bombed, and then the citizens in the village organize to provide the political backbone uh, for the Viet Cong in that village. You might say, well, you know, of course we know that the people who get bombed are going to get angry, um, but isn't the point of bombing um, just to intimidate their neighbors? And so the neighboring villages say, oh, we better, you know, we better do what the U.S. says because we don't want to get bombed too. Uh, we don't find evidence for this. Um, you know, um, to the extent that spillovers exist, they go in the same direction as the main effects. And so it's not as if people elsewhere are cooperating more with the US because they see um, their neighbors being bombed. Um, I should also say that you can measure security in different ways with public opinion data, et cetera, with data from the military. I mean, you're gonna find very similar effects. So this is not an artifact of the data source. Um, we look at other outcomes, local government administration, public goods. Remember part of the goal is to build a, a state um, you know, that can stand up to communism when the US leaves. And instead, the opposite happens. The local government is less likely to collect taxes. They're less likely to have all their village committee positions filled. Um, there's lower access to primary and secondary schools. And again, you see this in the raw data. Um, this is whether or not the village committee positions are filled. The village committee is in charge of providing public goods. You're just barely below the threshold, so you're more likely to get bombed. And you don't even have, you know, you're less likely to have all the positions in your local government filled access to a primary school, you know, same thing. And then finally, we can look at civil society um, and, and specifically non-communist civil society. And we see um, that bombing uh, reduces participation in non-communist civic organizations um, and, uh, you know, reduces other measures of civil society. So this is participation in the civic organizations. And again, you see, so you're just barely below the threshold. And so you're more likely to get bombed on the left side of that graph. Um, then people in your village are less likely to participate in civic organizations because you just saw like, you know, a few slides ago that instead of participating in this non-communist civic organization, they're joining the Viet Cong, um, which again is undermining US objectives. Okay, so that's the summary evidence on what bombing did. You know, was there uh, an alternative approach that was uh, better at achieving um, U.S. objectives um, in Vietnam. Um, we also look at hearts and minds initiatives for that. And in particular, we're going to exploit the fact that U.S. military leaders did not agree on whether they should be using this, you know, top-down overwhelming force or whether they should do something more kind of bottom-up and hearts and minds um, uh, motivated. Um, and so in particular, the Army which was uh, you know, formed during the US Civil War. World War II was a formative period. These were conflicts where you know, essentially you lined up and whoever unleashed the most firepower won. Um, they um, favored search and destroy missions that aimed to um, ferret out the Viet Cong using force. Um, whereas you know, in contrast, um, the US Marine Corps, which had been formed kind of as an imperial police force in the a uh, pseudo imperial police force, at least in the Caribbean and Central America for the US, they had a history kind of of working more with local authorities and being a police force rather than kind of a military that just unleashed as much firepower as they could. And they favored a more hearts and minds oriented approach where you worked um, essentially um, uh, with, um, with local leaders. I mean, so you have these kind of two different strategies by these different uh, branches of the military um, when you see here, the Marines are providing health care, they're providing, um, uh, you know, uh, vaccinations to children. Um, and uh, so what we're going to do is exploit the fact that there is a discontinuity in whether or not the Marines or the Army was the commanding force. Um, this boundary seems pretty exogenous. We don't see free period characteristics differing on it. So we're going to compare places on either side of this boundary to the north. Um, the US Marine Corps were the commanding force, the South the US Army were. Um, and what we show is, first of all, the public goods that the Marines targeted, like primary education, health, and infrastructure, were indeed substantially higher on their side of the boundary. And so they were actually kind of doing what they claimed to do. Um, on the Marine side, there were fewer Viet Cong attacks and attitudes towards American, and the levels of South Vietnamese government were more positive. You know, so at least relative to this overwhelming firepower strategy. Um, you know, this appeared to be more effective in achieving U.S. objectives. Of course, we can't say whether the U.S. should have gotten into the Vietnam War at all, but conditional on being there and fighting that war, um, it appears to have been 
kind of more effective in achieving their objectives to use this more hearts and minds oriented approach where they try to collaborate with locals rather than just kind of unleashing as much firepower as possible. And so these cases highlight the ways in which top-down military force approach can backfire when targeted insurgents are embedded in civilian population centers. Um, military campaigns like the bombing in Vietnam, uh, like you know, unleashing indiscriminate firepower that impacts civilian populations may create more insurgents than they defeat. Um, you know, so while we can't fully isolate the mechanisms through which, you know, the army and the Marines differ, these results are consistent with the view that hearts and minds strategies can be effective um, relative to a more exclusive reliance on military force. Okay, so that's um, Vietnam. And then kind of the, the final few minutes, I'd like to bring in another example from a very different uh, sort of context. And so in Vietnam, you see a conflict which was heavily based on sort of on foreign intervention, on trying to defeat a communist insurgency, um, but with the ultimate goal of creating a state um, that would be capable of monopolizing violence. Um, and in the more recent Mexican drug war, you kind of see a similar set of objectives. Um, there's these transnational criminal organizations that effectively control various parts of Mexico and the central government wants to wrest control from them, you know, regain its monopoly on violence. How does it try to do that? Um, and how do different strategies work? Um, and um, so this is a question that I've looked at in a paper called Trafficking Networks in the Mexican Drug War. And there, I want to understand both the direct and the spillover effects of cracking down, um, the state cracking down on the Mexican drug trade. And you know, like in the case of Vietnam, of course, like the state may choose to crack down in places where drug violence is deteriorating in any case, like that could be like a clear motivation for them. And so again, you really need an identification strategy. And what I use in that paper is the fact that it was um, one political party initially that really heavily emphasized cracking down on the drug trade. Um, and so I look at local mayors and whether or not they were from the political party that emphasized cracking down, which was the conservative um, pawn political party. And in Mexico, by and large, local governments do not have the capacity to take on drug traffickers on their own. They're heavily armed, quite sophisticated. Um, but what they can do is call up the federal government and say, I want to cooperate with you. And the local leaders from the party that had taken on combating the drug trade had more career incentives to do that, to call up the federal government and say, I want to be a team player with the party's policy. Um, we're going to give you information. Can you come help us crack down? Of course, they could have also been ideologically motivated. Um, and um, so in short, we're going to use those close elections. You just barely have a mayor from the party that favors cracking down on the drug trade and see what happens afterwards. Um, and we're going to also look at spillovers and trying to understand mechanisms by having a model of equilibrium routes for trafficking drugs through Mexico um, to the US. Because overwhelmingly, these criminal organizations their economic motivation is to get as many drugs to the US through Mexico as they possibly can. Um, so I'm just going to summarize briefly the results. Um, we find that drug trade related violence increases substantially after the close election of a mayor from the pawn party, which favors cracking down on the drug trade. And what happens um, is, you know, not just that you see um, the authorities killing drug traffickers, that, that does happen. They bring in the, you know, the federal police um, and the military and kind of try to take out the leaders um, of the drug gang in that municipality. But most of the violence is overwhelmingly people who are involved in the drug trade killing each other. And so what's going on? Why is it after a crackdown that you see actually for a sustained period for years um, drug traffickers in that municipality getting involved in this um, gang war where they're killing each other. Well, we can understand what's going on by thinking about the IO of the drug trade. And you really see this happen. You see these huge violent effects when the, you know, the mayor calls up the federal government, says, come crack down on the gang in my municipality for me. And there happens to be a rival gang that controls the territory next door. 
And so um, what happens after you kind of crack down on that incumbent gang is the rival gang doesn't expect the crackdown to be permanent. I mean, the mayor is going to move on, the federal government is going to go somewhere else and crack down somewhere else. And it's still a lucrative territory to get drugs across Mexico to the US. And so the neighboring gang says, oh, well, my enemy was just weakened by this federal crackdown. I'm going to try to come in and essentially finish them off so I can take control of this territory. And when the crackdown's over, I'm going to have this very valuable territory. Uh, but these gangs are very heavily armed, and that leads just to sustained conflict within them. And so essentially, this crackdown destabilizes the equilibrium, destabilizes the incumbents, and you have drug, drug gangs that just start fighting over control. Um, and the state doesn't have the capacity really to shut that down altogether. The federal government has moved on to cracking down somewhere else, and this violence is very sustained once you've disrupted the equilibrium. Um, in addition, you know, in terms of the drugs, what we see is that while the crackdown is in force, we can predict where the drug groups go, and we see, you know, evidence that they just essentially go around the municipality and keep on taking their drugs to the U.S., um, and violence along those alternative routes that they're now using to take the drugs to the U.S. Um, you know, also increases. And so essentially the strategy, again, of just having the federal government come in and use overwhelming firepower seems to have backfired. And, you know, the federal government is not the same thing as a foreign invader, but in some ways there are parallels there. It's an outside force that basically what they know how to do is use overwhelming firepower. You know, they don't, you know, have necessarily kind of expertise on the local situation. They're just coming in, they're unleashing firepower, they're getting the information they need to do that from the local authorities, and then they're kind of moving on, which is not entirely dissimilar, um, you know, from a, you know, a, a, a foreign conflict where a foreign power comes in, like in Vietnam, into something that the, that's um, in some ways similar. And so this is just a figure to sum up those results. This is the, the effect of having a mayor from the party that cracks down on the drug trade is barely elected. And so you can see for like, um, essentially for, you know, years and years um, prior, there's no difference in these municipalities. And then when the mayor from the party that cracks down barely wins and comes in and cracks down, there's this jump upwards, you know, these are quarters. So this is showing you that for several years afterwards, as long as the data goes, um, violence increases. And so essentially, once you let the genie out of the bottle and destabilize these gangs, the conflict between them is, is very drawn out. You know, in this paper, you know, I worked on this paper essentially like 10 years ago, and you still have, you know, um, incredibly high levels of, of violence in Mexico today. Okay, um, so this leads me to the, the final paper that I want to discuss on um, the violent consequences of trade-induced worker displacement in Mexico. Uh, which is a paper with uh, uh, Kensuke Tashima and Ben Feigenberg. And um, we um, were motivated in part by this uh, quote by um, uh, the drug board El Chapo Guzman when he had his you know, famed interview um, with Sean Penn. Um, and he was asked, so, so why did you get into the drug trade? And he says, well, in my area, meaning you know, his geographic area, there are no job opportunities. Um, that's why I got involved. And so we want to look at the other side of things. We looked at the impact of government crackdowns on violence? What about the impact of uh, worker displacement of job loss um, on drug violence? Um, and, you know, uh, so um, as always, we're going to need an identification strategy. Um, we want to look at the effects of trade-induced manufacturing job loss on homicide rates and patterns of drug trafficking act activity in Mexico, because during the period that there was a huge increase in violence, a lot of jobs also fled Mexico for China. Um, and they were different jobs across time. And so when China first comes on to the kind of the, the world stage in terms of trade, they're doing really low skilled things like textiles and those textile jobs in Mexico get hammered. And then as China's comparative advantage shifts, you see across time, it starts to be, you know, like the places in Mexico producing computers um, that are losing their jobs to China. And so in order to identify these effects, we're going to employ an IV strategy that's been used elsewhere in the literature um, or a similar version of it has that um, exploits plausibly exogenous variation in manufacturing job loss in Mexico that results from US market competition um, from Chinese um, exporters. Um, and so the instrument interacts baseline industry specific Chinese exports to the US with baseline industrial composition of Mexican municipalities. Um, and um, the instrument has a very strong first stage. You know, if China starts producing something that your municipality initially had a comparative advantage in, um, you face 
um, major job loss because now the U.S. is going to import that stuff from China and not import it from Mexico. And so um, a one standard deviation increase in trade induced job loss leads to an increase in the homicide rates of seven per 100,000. That's a big effect. You know, on average, the homicide rate in the U.S. Um, and is five per 100,000. And of course, the U.S. has a pretty high homicide rate compared to some other um, industrialized countries. Um, and that increase is substantially larger when those job losses are predicted to affect low-skilled young men. It's really about the jobs that, um, that low-skilled and young men are concentrated in. When those jobs go, um, that's when you really see these effects on violence, which you know, we kind of might have expected just based on anecdotal evidence. And in particular, the effects are much larger when there was already a major drug gang present in the municipality beforehand, whereas in places that didn't have a drug gang presence to start with, there's no effect on violence. Um, and so really this violence is happening in places that have this organization um, of like, you know, organized crime of these drug gangs. It's not that people losing their jobs are becoming criminal entrepreneurs and going out and killing people on their own. You know, they're choosing to work um, for these drug gangs that are already there. Um, moreover, we see a substitution towards um, cocaine trafficking in response to job losses. And cocaine trafficking is the most labor intensive. If you have this high dollar cocaine shipment being brought through the municipality, you um, leverage a lot of low skilled labor, a lot of lookouts to be on the lookout for your rival gang who may try to steal it to be on the lookout for authorities. Um, you know, we don't find an evidence for politically induced changes in enforcement as an intermediating mechanism. So this is really, you know, the part that's about um, when you have job loss, you know, that also is going to increase participation in the drug trade. There is evidence kind of for El Chapo's assertion that when there's not jobs, you know, then, then people are going to turn to the drug trade and that's going to create, um, essentially that's going to create violence. Um, and we think it's because if you have a larger base of low skilled labor, it's more lucrative to control that municipality. And so drug gangs will then start fighting over that municipality um, or, you know, factions within them, you know, will start fighting. And this is very similar in a sense to the results of the crackdowns where it was disrupting the incumbent gang um, that spurs conflict. And so, you know, in summary, vanquishing drug gangs with top-down force in Mexico has proved challenging and, you know, largely unsuccessful. The homicide rate essentially just keeps going up um, because um, there are economic incentives to participate and also because the local authorities aren't very effective. You know, they have to work with the federal authorities and when the federal military goes somewhere else, um, the drug gangs know that they'll be able to continue to operate with impunity. Um, and so in short, I would sum up kind of the lessons that, that I take from this paper, as well as the lessons I take from the work on Vietnam, um, as you know, certainly creating economic opportunity um, is not <laughs> easy at all. You know, the entire fields, you know, of economics, development economics, labor economics, we all think about and struggle with that. It's not an easy thing to do. You know, building local state and society structures is also not an easy thing to do. Those are big open questions. Um, you know, the, these are incredibly challenging. Um, you know, in, in comparison, it seems much easier in some sense to, to, to just send in the military and have them unleash overwhelming force. Um, but this has pitfalls and kind of if the goal is to build kind of state capacity in general, you know, to crack down on, on crime in general, you need to have economic opportunities and you need to have local state society structures that, that, that people think it's beneficial for them to participate in um, in order to avoid some of these um, perils of, of top-down force. Um, so that's kind of um, the summary of what I want to say. And I think now that we can open it up to questions. All right, um, Melissa, thank you very much for this great and interesting presentation. I'm gonna allow people to use their microphone to ask a direct question, but not before they wave their hands. So we, we, I can pick somebody to, to ask a question. So you can use the reactions uh, button there and then wave your hand like this. So I will now wave my hand so I can ask uh, the first question. So those who wave their hands that I will, I will point to you when you, when you want to ask a question. Is, is that clear? So I think that's a little bit more active than only using the chat uh, version. So, all right, um, Melissa, on, on the Vietnam work, um, I was wondering, so this 
bombing ent intensity and the discontinuity de design that you used, do you see any uh, effects on the current state of, of, of Vietnam, uh, local development, um, local GDP, uh, local uh, labor market conditions or, or what have you? Um, you've been talking about the, the effect that it was counterintuitive uh, for the US. So it uh, run counter to their idea to build a state. But I guess that was at that time. At that time, they didn't see any positive effects. And you even say they are counterproductive. But could you see anything that these effects uh, run even till today? I'm not sure if you have looked at that. And if yes, maybe you can tell us something about it. If no, uh, are you wanting to work on that in the future or have you done so? Yeah. Yeah, so we did look at that and we essentially find results that are very similar to, there's a paper by um, Ted Miguel and Gerard Roland on this, this topic where they use a totally different identification strategy, but they don't find long-term economic effects of bombing and using our identification strategy, we don't either. The one thing that we see is that you see more state-owned enterprises and places that were more bombed. And so we think essentially what's going on is, you know, um, that, that, that some places, you know, were more bombed, they had more destruction, but afterwards you have the Vietnamese state come in and rebuild them and essentially put um, some state-owned enterprise there um, that, you know, kind of helps to rebuild the economic activity. Um, and so um, in the long run, you don't see, um, you, you don't see economic effects. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, Rahul, um, you wrote your question in the chat already, but you please uh, use the microphone so that then you can ask it directly. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Melissa, thanks a lot for a very inspiring talk. Uh, just a very quick question. Uh, based on your work, uh, so linking together your work of both on Vietnam, but also recent work on Indonesia with Ben Olkin, uh, can you say something more about uh, essentially the persistent impacts and the mechanisms through which these impacts play out? Uh, comparing violent repression versus colonial institutions. So what kind of persistent impacts we would expect through these two, uh, these two treatments, if I may, on uh, long-term nation building and future state capacity? Yeah, um, and so let me like kind of first summarize for people what we did um, in, in Indonesia. So we looked at the Dutch cultivation system, which uh, was a system that forced um, uh, peasants in Java to produce sugar for the Dutch. It was, um, you know, it was a huge share of Dutch revenues. It was probably the kind of, at least in financial terms, the largest example of colonial exploitation in history. And so we look at kind of two different effects, um, being forced to provide labor for the system and also being close to the sugar factories that they built. And so sugar has to be processed essentially on site and they built nearly a hundred sugar factories across Java as well as infrastructure um, to take um, the sugar output um, to the port so they could export it and sell it on world markets. Um, and what we find is that that actually has a positive effect on long-run development. And so what you see is that the places that are near the sugar factories um, today, they still have better infrastructure um, because essentially the Dutch built a lot of the infrastructure that exists in Java today. Um, and they have more manufacturing, and in particular, they have manufacturing that's downstream of sugar production. And at the time, you know, the Dutch took all the good sugar, but they left the low quality sugar um, to be sold on Javanese markets. And so you see kind of industries pop up near these places, and they're still there today. And so, you know, essentially there seems to be these, these agglomeration effects where the Dutch, you know, brought in a lot of capital and infrastructure and then you still see, you see more economic activity cluster around that historically. And today, you know, even, um, you know, um, over a hundred years after the system has been abolished, you still see those effects, you know, which by the way, is very different than the results in another paper I have on colonial exploitation in Peru, which shows negative long run effects of mining. Uh, but of course, mining is a very different industry. And that once you take all the silver out, it's gone, and there's just one mine, and you make all the labor go to that mine. And so essentially, you don't build any infrastructure. So you don't have these kind of countervailing like economic effects. And so I'd say that the lesson from that is, of course, everybody agrees that colonial exploitation was like horrible at the time, and it may have national effects that are very bad. But if you want to say, okay, well, why is, you know, there's so much variation in development within a country? Um, you know, does that have to do with colonial exploitation? Actually, it's really important to think about the nature of that exploitation. 
you know, how much was it just kind of trying to plunder the place versus how much did they have to make, you know, investments that actually kind of stick around in the long run, like, you know, infrastructure. And those are two very different kind of um, forms of exploitation for long run development. Um, and so kind of, you know, in turn, kind of how this, this, this um, potentially ties into what I talked about today. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, so, so how, did the, how did the Dutch convince people to do this, right? Um, essentially, it wasn't through top-down force. Like, um, what they did was to provide incentive payments to the existing leaders. And sometimes they did use force, but that's, you know, by far kind of the exception, not the equilibrium path. So essentially, you know, they, they found a way to buy in um, local elites. Um, and get them involved. You know, we actually don't see effects on, you know, state capacity, political type outcomes today. More what we see is the economic effects. Um, but again, you know, it's kind of like it's, it's, a, it's a form of exploitation where they manage to kind of get local buy-in for it. And they, they provided incentive payments, which at least in theory were supposed to go to the people working the land. And, you know, in practice, the local elites may have sometimes taken them. Um, but they did kind of try to, 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 to set up incentives that were presumably less than the market wage or they would have just had free labor, um, but that nevertheless kind of, you know, gave people um, sort of some incentive to participate. So it wasn't kind of a, a pure top-down force thing, which I think would have probably actually been less effective for, um, for the Dutch. Thank you. Um, next is Eva Maria Egger, who can ask a question. Yes, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, talk. and. Um, I am more familiar with the crime literature uh, coming more from the Brazilian context. So I wanted to pick up on your insights on the Mexican drug war. And uh, so one example in Brazil was that they tried to introduce these kind of social police forces as a bottom up approach, right, to kind of win the hearts and minds. And it didn't seem to work so well. And so I was wondering uh, what your take is also on the challenge around kind of a governance by the drug gangs themselves and how that interaction works of, you know, the drug gangs kind of locally competing to winning hearts and minds from a bottom-up approach and how that also poses an additional challenge to these different approaches. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah I think that that's, that's sort of definitely, um, that's definitely true. Um, and, um, you know, so we've seen kind of the, um, the pitfalls of the um, of the of the top down approach, but like in you know what I presented, you know in Vietnam, I was actually able to look at the bottom up approach. I still obviously can't say that if the U.S. had done that everywhere, that they would have won the Vietnam War. You know, they may be the the lesson that we should take away in general is that the the U.S. shouldn't have gotten involved, right? But that's obviously not something that can be looked at empirically. Um, because there's no variation. I mean, I agree that, that that sort of, you know, how we do a bottom-up approach is really, um, is, is something that we need a lot more research on. And there is, you know, kind of, I'm sure that many of you here today have kind of worked on various manifestations of this, because it's not like as if it's guaranteed to succeed either. Like the world's kind of not that simple. Essentially, you have to give people reasons like to, support the state rather than to support the drug gangs who may, um, you know, in, in various contexts provide functions that are somewhat similar to a state, you know, providing, you know, um, uh, development assistance and, and things like that, jobs to, to, to the community. Um, and so I think I don't have like a two minute answer to kind of how you make that work. And I think that it's an area that we need more research on. But I think that when you look at kind of the efforts to just go in and use the central government to control places through sheer force, that in the long run, that's not gonna work unless you have local buy-in and that, that people um, you know, have positive incentives to um, to wanna support what the state's doing and they actually want the state and not the gangs to be in charge. All right, um, then I have another question. So coming back to, to this bombing campaign, um, I, I'm familiar with the work of, of Miguel and Gerard, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if these bombings, when they invigorated the, the, the Viet Cong, does that also result in uh, the people coming together and building social bonds and, and stronger institutions there where, where there was more bombing? Uh, is there anything 
evidence of that, that it was counterproductive exactly because they, uh, the bombing brought people together and, and built uh, local institutions? Yeah, I mean, so certainly, like, I think we see some evidence of that historically just in them participating in the, the Viet Cong, organizing Viet Cong infrastructure, you know, organizing um, insurgency, you know, whether or not that persists to today is actually like a very difficult question to answer because there's essentially no data. And essentially to our knowledge, we talked to some people at the World Bank because we were precisely interested in this question who had tried to collect that kind of data and they said, like the government, you know, wouldn't allow it. Um, you know, essentially there's this idea that there's this communist party structure and that's how local government functions kind of uniformly across Vietnam. But in practice, people think, you know, that kind of the informal government structure is the civic society is pretty important. And like, you know, um, we, we, we would really like to study that, but <laughs> as of now, we just have, you know, no way to collect um, that data. Maybe there's some clever way to speak to it, but it's not easy with existing sources. Yeah, 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 for sure. Thank you. Uh, and anybody else? Uh, I see Rahul there, but uh, maybe if anybody else first wants to ask another question, then I'm going to look around. Uh, no, please, Rahul, uh, go ahead. Uh, sorry for being greedy, uh, Philip. Happy to wait my turn in case uh, other people have questions as well. Uh, very quick, uh, very uh, interesting comment was made by Melissa in a recent interview, maybe with Tyler Cowen, about some research that you were interested in about on the polio vaccine and how uh, when the first vaccination strategies were being rolled out in the US, uh, uh, randomly uh, some defective vaccines were kind of distributed uh, across uh, uh, so, uh, some regions and that may have led to some long-term persistent impacts uh, in uh, terms of loss of trust uh, in, uh, in vaccinations in general. I was wondering whether you pursued that research and uh, have any preliminary uh, kind of uh, <laughs> insights to share with the audience because yeah. quite uh, topical at the moment. I have. I mean, I think some of the outcomes we want, we can't get until the archives reopen <laughs> because everywhere is closed now, right? Um, the other thing we're doing, though, is to, to digitize historical newspapers on a large scale so we can kind of see kind of the um, the, the attitudes that prevail in, in the press as a result. So if you have this tragedy where children are given a contaminated vaccine and some children die or are paralyzed, you know, what does that do to the sorts of content you publish in your newspapers? And we don't have answers to that yet because it's kind of a big project. We have, you know, millions and millions of page scans of newspapers and we're just processing those. But, you know, hopefully um, when the archives reopen and we finish processing the data, I'll be able to, to tell you more. I think I, yeah, I more generally have this interest in Kind of building trust in the state over the long run and sometimes the state kind of messes up in this case they should have been regulating vaccine manufacturers and they actually just really dropped the ball and so what happens like how does how does the state messing up kind of impact trust in the state over the long run thank you we have patricia justino uh, asking a question now hi uh thank you very much uh for the talk um I have actually uh, two, two questions. So I sympathize with the view that uh, a bottom-up approach to state building is probably more sensible. Uh, and uh, if we're talking about conflict-affected countries, uh, often the top-down the top -down approach is about to fail because you have unresolved issues of armed groups, alliances with local populations, and so forth, which become really, really difficult to, uh, to address with a military solution. On the other hand, uh, from a bottom-up perspective, also has to deal with the fact that these same relations will result in a, a fragmentation of authority, most likely, which is also very difficult to, to solve. So I was wondering if you have some thoughts on that. And then if I can, I had another uh, related question is, some of these issues are also very different. So if you compare Vietnam or, or some of the modern civil wars we see, we see uh, rebel groups that actually have an intention of replacing the state. Uh, so the, the motivation is actually, you know, to contest the role of the state. Whereas in the case of Mexico and Brazil, so forth, we have gangs which have no intention whatsoever of replacing the state and they build sort of economies around their drugs, their, their drug markets and so forth. So this will presumably lead to very, very different dynamics of state building. So uh, I was wondering also if you have some thoughts on that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that, that that's right, that, that at a more granular level, 
like there's a lot of differences and so you know how we kind of pursue that bottom-up approach um, is going to be different and I do think that within kind of the conflict literature and even within the military there is kind of a, like a greater appreciation um, for the benefits and also the challenges of kind of working more with local partners, um, you know, having economic development um, be a centerpiece, you know, trying to build civil society. Um, if you look what the public thinks, I think they still have this kind of view that you come in with guns blazing and that can, um, that, that can solve the problem. Um, but um, again, I think that, that, um, that, that, that they are very different contexts and like, we don't really have good evidence, say, in the case of Mexico, what would work from the bottom up. You know, at one point we tried to partner with the government um, to, to do some field experiments to get at that. Um, but then there was a leadership change and a leadership change thought, like, what's this social development stuff? That's for the social development ministry. We send in the military. Like, why are you trying to use this to kind of achieve military objectives? And so I think it's still kind of it's, a, it's an open question, you know, we have some papers from Brazil, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, we need more research on this. And so I know that, that some people here are working on it and I really hope people will continue to work on it because I think, you know, um, there, there's actually more open questions than things that, that we've resolved. Olivia wants to ask something. She has written something in the chat. Olivia, do you want to say it using the microphone, please? Uh, maybe you can uh, just ask for me because I am uh, traveling, so I'm listening. <laughs> no problem. Um, you, uh, you wrote very interesting talk, Melissa. The issue of social innovations is very interesting. How can it be used for transformation? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Maybe, Melissa, you grasp the question better than I. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's it's probably like to an extent there's not going to be kind of like a one size fits all approach. And so, I mean, it's a little bit hard for me to, to talk in, in general about what those social innovations will be. Um, but I think again, if you look at kind of like a group like the Viet Cong insurgency, or you look at drug gangs in Brazil or in Mexico, part of the ways that they gain that support is that they do have, they do kind of try to infiltrate local social structures, kind of local civic society. Um, and oftentimes they're, they're, they're much better at that than the, you know, the state who's trying to pursue kind of a top-down approach who um, is, is, is much less doing that. And so, um, you know, not that I would advocate using necessarily the, 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 the same approaches that a drug gang would use, um, but I think that, that you can also kind of look at the, the strategies that insurgents or that criminal groups have used and they're not all, just, you know, they certainly use terror um, but they also use um, kind of, you know, providing public goods, you know, other, other things, and then maybe the state can learn something from that. All right. Um, one more question from my behalf to make sure I understand the Mexico work. The homicide rate that you used, was it, was it going up in, in the U.S. as a result of, of Chinese um, imports, or was it going up in Mexico? I think I, I yeah. failed to grasp that. All right. I probably went too quickly. And so we're focused here on Mexico. And so what the US does is give us an identification strategy, right? So if the US starts, you know, you know, importing stuff from China and so they're from Mexico, that's going to lead to a decline in employment in a Mexican municipality. And then when you look at that municipality, when employment declines, and particularly when unskilled young male employment declines, then drug violence goes up. Um, and we argue that's because these guys are now entering the drug trade, they're fighting over opportunities in the drug trade, um, and that's leading to an increase in violence as compared to when you have that factory in Mexico that's providing unskilled employment um, for, for young men in Mexico. All right, excellent. I'm gonna look around to the, to the audience if, to see if anybody else wants to ask a question. I guess everybody is looking that it's four o'clock and that they're not allowed anymore to ask a question. <laughs> so, um, Melissa, uh, thank you very much for this great presentation and for sharing your uh, different papers uh, with us, the ideas of those papers and the connections between the papers. And thank you very much for joining us today.
Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. We can we can share uh, we can show our hands as a way to clap uh, digitally digitally digitally. Yeah. So that's uh, or we can also do that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, you're welcome to stay for the next session if you you know.